1 Corinthians chapter 8. You know the phrase, I'm certain, when Jesus said that they will know us, where he simply said that by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have. Oh, I'm certain you know it. It's one of those verses that probably you have just locked down, but I want you to think about it right now. I mean, if you didn't know, I mean, what is it that's supposed to define us? He says, this is the way the world's going to know. This is the way people are going to know that, that we're his. He says, this is the thing that's going to be, uh, you know, one of those characteristics that draw just incredible insight. He says, by this, all will, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That one of the defining marks that the world would know about who we are is by the way that we're driven by love, loving one another. I mean, I think about it, and I, and I know that maybe that makes just simple sense. At least I hope that it does. But I just can tell you, it's not always the way we actually think. I mean, sometimes I think about it. I saw I had this little graphic just sitting around in my computer, and it just, you know, they'll know that we're Christians by our, well, sometimes I think we really think it's our doctrine, by our understanding, by what we know, because I can answer questions, because I know the right answers. Well, they're going to know who I am because of my T-shirt, they're going to know that I'm a Christian by, you know, because I have a fish on my car. I mean, is, I mean, these are not the things that the world recognizes who we are. I mean, the thing that's going to define who we are is, is meant to be this love that, that God has for us. In fact, again, you guys know it. It's definitive of everything that we are. Guaranteed. Jesus said it when he was speaking about it. He says, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. It is the highest priority for every life, guaranteed. I mean, I just, I know it right now. I mean, right now for your life, what God wants is first and foremost that you're one that says, God, I just want to love you. I want my life to be one that is spent and walking in and, and recognizing not just that God loves me, but I want to love God. I mean, I want that to be my first priority. I want, I want to love God with everything I am. It's the greatest commandment. And then he said, okay, the second is like it, is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. There's nothing else that supersedes it. There's nothing else that goes around it. In Matthew's gospel, it says everything else hangs on this. I mean, these are fundamental to everything that we are. And it's supposed to be that way. And again, it's, it's actually this love that we love God and love people that's supposed to define even the way that we live, the choices that we make, the things that we wrestle with. I mean, it really is meant to be defined by that. So that the choice we make, the decisions we make, the things that we do, when they're done rightly, it's as if we're saying, God, I just want to love you, and I really want to love people. That's what is really at stake here. Paul's writing here in 1 Corinthians, and as a quick recap, where we are right now, Paul has planted a church there in the city of Corinth. He's gone on from that, and he's planting churches in other locations, and he has now heard, after he'd spent a year and a half there in Corinth, just pouring out his life for them, reports have been brought to him about things that were happening in the church. And for the first six chapters, he was able to have to step into those and deal with problems that were happening within the church. Starting in chapter 7, which is where we were last week, he begins to answer questions. Questions that they'd had, and really dealing with singleness and marriage in chapter 7, and how that whole thing works in the midst of a very, just a moral culture. That was where they were last week, but now they have another question. And that's what he begins to answer. It says in verse 1 of chapter 8, now concerning things offered to idols. Answering their question, Paul, what do we do about this? Now, if you know your Bible... Well, this, this is a question you might understand. In a sense, you, you kind of get it because it's dealt with here in chapter 8 and actually continues in chapter 9 and chapter 10 for part. Also dealt with in the book of Romans. So you might be aware of it, but just to be quite honest, if you weren't aware of it scripturally, it's probably nothing that's crossed your mind practically. I mean, quite honestly, I've never had anybody come to me and say, that's really what I'm wrestling with, Jim. 
I'm just really wondering if I'm supposed to eat meat sacrificed to idols. Now, I, I recognize somebody's going to do it now. I just, I know that, so we get that, but nobody's ever, I mean, it's just not honestly one of those questions that we really wrestle through. But it, honestly, it actually, the application of it is there. As they're asking this question, they're saying, okay, are we supposed to do this? Can we do this? Well, they're wrestling with some key factors, and yet, though the exact circumstances differ, the questions are quite similar. He's dealing with, in one sense, what we would call gray areas. And maybe just saying that phrase alone is helpful, and you get it, and, and we could just go past it. But it's worth just making sure, just in case, if you'll allow me to take a moment, just to make sure we understand what's being wrestled with here in chapter 8, and chapter 9, and chapter 10, and again in Romans 14. He's dealing with gray areas. And if you want to think about it this way, what I mean by gray areas is there are some things that are black and white. I mean, they're absolutely right, and there's some things that are absolutely wrong. In between, there are gray areas. See, we think about it, if we want to put it this way, there are things that we just know. We don't have any doubt about it, things that God tells us in his word. He wants us to know him. We're meant to be a people of prayer. We're meant to serve. We need fellowship. I mean, these are not optional things. These are not things that you could kind of just say, eh, not into that. <laughs> no, these are things that we could absolutely, 100% say, this is what God wants for your life. You don't even have to ask. I mean, we can uh, apply it, yes, but we know there are things that are absolutely right. There are other things that are absolutely wrong. Things like drunkenness and adultery and homosexuality. We know these things. Again, God has talked about it. In fact, we just did. I mean, the context of this in 1 Corinthians, he's just dealt with this, and he's just told us there are some things that are absolutely inconsistent with a Christian's life including things like adultery and homosexuality and coveting. These are things, he says, that lifestyles lived that way. It's not an option. These are not things that are okay. There's not any way that somebody could take some of the principles that are given in this chapter and apply it to those things. No, that's not it. These are they're black and whites. There are things that are 100% we know are right, and there are things that are 100% we know are wrong. But then there's these areas that kind of fall in between, things that... They're not clearly right, and they're not clearly wrong either. I mean, Scripture doesn't address them, nor exactly what they are, and Christians spend a great deal of time sometimes actually having to wrestle with this. You know, what's the right thing for us to do? The, the number of things that fall into that category are many, but you could imagine there are things that would include things like smoking or TV or worship style or what kind of clothes can you wear to church or, you know, can, can Christians play games or play sports or what kind of music can you listen to? I mean, there are things that you, people are thinking, okay, you know, and sometimes people can be incredibly passionate about some of these things and people want to say, okay, so what's the right thing? What's black? What's right? These aren't things that are addressed in Scripture. These are things among many areas that find itself in this place that, you know, it's not right or wrong. I mean, all by itself, it doesn't come out that way. There's, 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 there's many factors that go into it. And when we think about how to do these things, well, the question is, how do we do that? How do we decide, you know, when to do that? How do we decide what we're supposed to do? Well, that's what they're partly wrestling with. Now, it might help also, if you're not already aware of it, just to kind of place yourself back in Corinth for a moment idolatry. It's a big deal. It's big business in Corinth. There are idol temples everywhere. I mean, it's a part of their culture. There probably wasn't a street you could hardly go down that it wasn't, you know, it just impacted by this. It's a booming business. And one of the effects of that into their culture was actually eating meat. Because see, here's how it worked. Meat was the most, it was the most easiest place to come by meat, and it was the cheapest place to get it. And, and you kind of can just imagine how this works. We know from the culture and understanding it how it worked that the temples, the way they would work, and somebody would come and they would prevent, present their sacrifice to this temple. The priest would take a portion of that sacrifice and burn it on the altar, but the rest was theirs. And so the priest would use that for their livelihood, some of them eating it, and quite honestly, it was such good business that they'd begun selling it. They would take the, the meat that had been sacrificed that they didn't keep, kind of at the back side of it or on the corner lot of, of every temple, there was a meat market. And it was the cheapest meat in town. I mean, you got to just understand, there's like no overhead. I mean, they got it for free. 
You know, they didn't have to pay anything for it, and now they get to sell it. it you know, they, could, they could undercut anything. It was, the best, it was often the best meat in town, and it was the cheapest. And, and, and so now here's this, these Christians that get saved, and they're honestly asking, so can we do that? I mean, now can we eat that meat? It's been sacrificed to idols, Paul. Can, can we as Christians you know, partake in this bargain? You know, can we get the good meat? Can, is this an okay thing for us to do? And they're looking for answers for how they do it. And again, maybe you kind of get it. It's, it's, it's kind of a gray area. It's like, okay, well, it's not. There's, there's, there's factors on both sides of this kind of working in there. So how do we do that? How do we, how did they navigate that difficult situation and then apply it to the situations that we face? Well, there are a couple things. He tells us as we begin there in chapter 8, verse 1, now concerning things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. And if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. Therefore, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is no other God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God and Father of whom are all things, and we for him, one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we live. Well, he contrasts a couple of issues as we kind of go into this, and we could kind of just sum it up. The first is really knowledge. And again, it kind of moves back and forth, but we're just going to kind of walk through this, just talk about knowledge for a moment. He says, when we think about knowledge, we can kind of approach this thing by understanding, okay, for starters, <laughs> idols are nothing. I mean, there aren't, it's not like there's competing gods up there. There's only one God. There's only one God. You know, every other God, it's a false God. He says, it's not that there are not other things called God that people don't address as a god, whether it be a Hindu god or a Muslim god. But it's just not God. It's not like there's other gods up there, you know, like as if you could pick, there's only one. In fact, I love the way that the psalmist kind of presents it to us. He says, their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes they have, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. He says, you look on this whole thing and here you have these idols and it's as if they, they're these physical representations that have eyes and ears. And he says, but you look upon them and it's not true. It, it, it's not actually there. You know, they have eyes, but they, they don't actually see because they're not really there. They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses they have, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not handle. Feet they have, but they do not walk. Nor do they mutter through their throat. There's kind of a divine comedy taking place in this, and I hope you can kind of get it. It's as if he says, you know, they have gods, but their gods don't do anything. I mean, they, they hear these people, they say they worship another god, or they talk to these other gods, but they, you know, they, they actually can't. They're not actually, any, they're not actually capable. They, don't, they can't even begin to speak into all of this. There's not anything happening in the midst of all of that. And he's telling us right now, they're, they're just, there's nothing else there. So here's all these idolatrous temples all around Corinth, and God is just, Paul is just speaking to it. He says, you know, this is what we understand. It's not like there's a battle of the gods in this whole thing. It's not like, you know, in one sense, that, in that, that that's now belonging to that. He says, you know, there are no other gods. There, there aren't any. There's only one God. We know that. We know that that's, that that's a part of it. He also adds to it that eating food, it doesn't really affect us in that sense spiritually. It doesn't make us better. Continue with us down as, as, as he goes on to say this, as he helps us kind of just get it going, verse 8 with me for a moment. It says, but food does not commend us to God. For neither if we eat are we the better, nor if we do not eat are we the worse. It doesn't actually make you a better Christian depending on what meal you ate, or a worse one. I mean, I mean, maybe there's healthy factors into it, and there's something in that, but in one sense, I know that you get it. It's not actually affecting us that way. It, it's not actually as if those things have spiritual merit. Jesus had to deal with the same thing from a different perspective. He tells us there in Mark 7, he calls the multitude himself, and he, and he said to them, hear me, everyone, and understand there is nothing that enters a man from the outside which can defile him 
But the things that come out of him, these are the things that defile a man. They had come to come into the place there in Judaism and kind of just moving into some weird things that they had begun to think that if they ate their food, it tells us in the verses before this, with unwashed hands. And they didn't just mean like dirty hands, like, you know, your hands are like filled with germs, but they kind of saw them as spiritually clean, that you had to go through a spiritual ritual of cleansing. And they kind of had gotten into the place that, you know, if you didn't do that... <laughs> You know, you can get some spiritual cooties, you know, kind of thing. You know, you, you, know, you just, you didn't, you didn't go through it. And so now, you know, that can affect you and it can make your soul unclean that maybe demons would be involved in it somehow or, or, or some, you know, just in the midst of the whole thing. And so they just had gotten into this place and Jesus says, it doesn't do that way. I mean, that's, it, there's nothing that can do that. There's nothing that can enter you from the outside. And I just want to tell you, there's huge ramifications in this. It's not what we eat. It's not... You know, you know, just kind of handling things or anything. It says that's not the way it works. What makes us unclean is the stuff that comes out of our own heart. <laughs> I mean, that's our problem. Our problem is inside of us. It's not, you know, the, going through those things. And he tells us, do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from the outside cannot defile him? Because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach, and is eliminated, thus purifying all foods. I mean, it's like, okay, you ate it, it went into your stomach. I mean, it didn't really affect you or your spirit. It doesn't work that way, and it, it just doesn't. So kind of putting it into practice, understanding it this way, idolatrous meat couldn't hurt them. That just because it had been sacrificed to an idol, there's no spiritual connotation where because it had been sacrificed to an idol, that somehow some resident spiritual cooties have rubbed off on them and they ate it, so now you know, somehow they're diminished or there's somehow, you know, a curse upon them or some kind of mess in the midst of it. It doesn't work that way. It, that's, that's not how it works. And again, I want to tell you, there's huge help in that because sometimes people find themselves thinking that way, thinking, you know, that there's something wrong in their life spiritually and they got to go and, you know, anoint every window seal or, you know, kind of, you know, bless all the dishes or, and I'm not trying to make fun and I don't mean to make fun, but I just, and just sometimes people think, well, that's what the problem is. I mean, there's something wrong and it says that's not the way it works. I mean, it, there's only one God and, and there's a sense that all the false gods, they're only phony. Yes, indeed, there are demonic beings that at times kind of help those things along, but catch it from this, from God's perspective, they can't hurt you spiritually. Greater is he who is within you than he who is in the world. You're not going to get spiritual cooties by eating meat that would be sacrificed to an idol. It's not as if that would somehow defy who you are. It's not the way it works. We, we have God and we, and we have that and he wants us to know that and you need to understand this, that knowledge can bring us into liberty. In fact, he kind of refers to it at the beginning of verse 9 where he says, beware lest somehow this liberty of yours... He's going to give us a warning about it, but before we get to the warning, I want to come back and say, it is a liberty. Liberty is a freedom and just a joyous thing. And I want you to know that God has brought us into that. And knowledge is a good thing. Please don't get from this passage that God is somehow dismissing knowledge. He's not. There's so many passages that tell us, you know, add to, to, to your knowledge, virtue, to virtue, knowledge. I mean, build yourself up in the knowledge of God. Truth can be an incredible, powerful thing in our life. It brings freedom. Jesus said, you know, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. There's liberty. There's, there's freedom in recognizing that Satan is such a liar and, and this world is so filled with lies. Like, that's just not true. It's not the way it works. And there's freedom in knowing that and there's a protection in that. God calls us to hold to that. In fact, in Galatians, it deals with this in a great deal with the whole thing and, and calls us not to allow ourselves to be brought back under bondage, to not to allow ourselves to be put back under laws and rules where he simply says, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. There is a sense where God's calling us into a place where that's where God has for us. And I want you to make sure you don't lose that in what we're about to say in the rest of the evening. Because does, it's not meant to be a yoke. He's not trying to make us burdened down with a list of rules and regulations. That's not what he has for us. No, we've been brought into freedom in Christ. And there's a wonderful freedom when we can say, okay, you know, our God is God and everything else is phony. And I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid and not living in fear of, 
uh, you know, behind every shadow of things, because I have a God who's bigger than all of that. But you probably already got it, because he launched the passage with telling us that there's a danger. There's a danger to knowledge, and that is knowledge that's not accompanied with, you know, the, the greater virtues, with, 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 with love and the things that God has for us. It becomes a dangerous thing. Go back and read it again in verse 1. Now, concerning things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. There's knowledge, that's, that's a great thing. Knowledge puffs up. Love edifies. Knowledge becomes one of these things that all by itself, it can lead to pride. That's the picture of being puffed up. Has this idea that it can cause walking in righteousness, we can begin to rock, walk in arrogance. And I want to tell you it happens. It happens in this area specifically. That sometimes people who enjoy their liberty in Christ and understand the freedom that they have sometimes look down on those who don't walk that way. And with a, with a, a sneer and a, and, and a snarl, and a, it just, it says that's, it's puffing up. I mean, I just think about it. I think it was, it was Warren Wiersbe that said it you know, this way. Some Christians grow while others just swell. And I think that's just a great kind of picture. It's just puffed up, you know, kind of like a puffer fish. You know, that's, it says there's no growth in that. There's no, there's no weight in that. There's no muscle in that. There's not, it's, it's, it's all a hot air. And there's a sense of just saying that's not what God has for us. He says there's a danger that you could just walk out of a Bible study. You could walk out of it and you can come out with knowledge. But knowledge alone isn't that alone. No, and knowledge is good. And, and what we've talked about already is good. You have this idols are nothing. There's only one God. It's not going to mess us up. It's not as if we're afraid of spiritual cooties. But here's what we are to be afraid of. Afraid of how it's going to affect other people. A, a, afraid of what it's going to do in other people. Go back to it again in verse 3. But if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. Therefore, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world. And there's no other God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, a lot of things that people call God that aren't, yet for us we know. I mean, there's one God and the Father of whom are of all things, and we for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. However, there is not in everyone this knowledge. He says, here's the thing, you just got to understand, though you might, un might get it, though you might understand it, not everybody gets it. <laughs> not everybody understands, you know, what, what maybe we understand. He says, for some with consciousness of the idol until now eat it as a thing offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Again, food does not commend us to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, nor if we do not eat are we the worse. But if someone eats that meat, and they think it's wrong, if someone eats that meat, and they go against their conscience, it actually does become sin. Not because it was a sin all by itself. It wasn't. I mean, he already told us that eating meat doesn't help you, doesn't hurt you, can't get hurt by the whole thing. But if your conscience, if it goes against your conscience, it becomes wrong for you. Paul deals with this in a greater way in Romans, but I'll just give it to you in one of the verses. Romans 14, it says it this way. It says, I know and I'm convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing in clean and of itself. Again, talking about gray areas, not the black and whites. But to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him, it's unclean. It says if you, if, you, if, you, if you think it's wrong, if you believe it's wrong for you to do it, and then you go against that, it's wrong. Now, again, I want to say this carefully and tenderly. He's not just talking here about doubts or those nagging kind of suspicions, because there are some people, and, and, and some of you, I, I, I love you to pieces, and I understand you have tender conscience, and you could feel guilty about anything. It's like, did I breathe too much air? You know, I just, I mean, I don't know what if I'm just doing, I do too much, you know, I just don't, and, and, and you could worry, I mean, just to, to tell you, you know, you know, if your conscience bothers you, you're like, I could never do anything, my conscience bothers me about everything, I understand that. He's not just talking about that condemnation that could come or fears, he's just saying if you really think it's wrong, if in your mind it's wrong, it's wrong, don't do it. Others might be able to do it, you can't, because you, you, you think it's wrong. For you to go against that, because others are free to do it or because you think that's what you're supposed to do, but you cross that line in your, in your own mind where you think you're sinning. He says, to you it's sin. It became sin because you thought it was so. 
because you'd set that line in your mind and that, that becomes a line for you. It's not one that you can put on other people, goes on in Romans 14 to tell us. We can't take that line and, and make it other people's you know, decision, but it's for you, it's wrong. Again, I like the way Jesus describes the, I mean, Paul describes the conscience in Romans 2. It says, their conscience also bearing witness between themselves and their thoughts, accusing or else excusing them. And I know that you get this, but that conscience, it's that inner policeman that God has placed in every one of us that when you feel like you're doing the right thing, it's like, I, I, I did the right thing. But when you know you're doing the wrong thing, it just, you, 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 you cross it. It's not just that nagging little fears or doubts or worries. It's that place, I, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> I shouldn't have done that. And he tells us if somebody goes and eats meat and maybe they get talked into doing it, maybe they're there and they're walking through the streets of Corinth and quite honestly, again, it was the cheapest meat. And some of what we understand is that some of them are even trade guilds and that, that people actually ate at some of these things. It's where business was sometimes conducted. So here you got two Christians and, and you know, here's this more mature Christian perhaps. He's like, Psst. It's nothing. Come on, let's just eat. I mean, just eat and you, get, you allow yourself to be talked into doing it. You, you just send. He says, your conscience is defiled. You know, he says, it, it becomes of this. And it, it becomes that forever that happens, it becomes sin for them because they do that. He tells us in verse 9, but beware lest somehow this liberty of, you, of yours becomes a stumbling block to those who are weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, I mean, you just kind of, you know, it wasn't a big deal for you, will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things offered to idols? And because of your knowledge shall the weak brother, brother perish for whom Christ died. But when you thus sin against your brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. I, again, it, it, there's a heaviness here, but I want to make sure you're there. I mean, the idea is that we're just, we're, he says, you don't, you don't want to become a stumbling block where it turns somebody else away from God. That, that what we ought to be concerned about is a passion where that's not what we want to do. Now, this is really not, I mean, if, if you've processed these things through, I just give this to you as qu a quick aside, although it, it, it's helpful. This doesn't mean we're captive to everybody's opinion of us doesn't mean that we now become people pleasers because some people will just, you know, have, you know this is what, it, they, they want us to do something, not because it's actually going to offend them or drive them away from Christ. They just have their opinions about how we're supposed to, supposed to live. That's not what he's saying. You can spend your whole life trying to please people. That's not the point. But he is saying, I'm more concerned, you know, I might be free to do it, but I, I should be more concerned about that person. I don't want to be one that would cause anybody to turn away from Christ because of me. I don't, that in that sense, he's calling me to have this passion where I'm just concerned about their souls. He says, I don't want to be, that to be a cause of offense. I don't want it to be there. And, and I don't want that to be the, the cause of which it's happening. So he calls us to the highest standard that God has for us. And you already got it. We've already kind of, we began the study this way, but it's love. He, he's calling us. He says, you know, that love in that sense becomes the answer goes back to it, it says again there in verse one knowledge puffs up but love edifies knowledge all by itself can make you arrogant where you could you know walk around and just well i can do it don't put your you know i can do anything i want in christ i mean i don't i'm not bound by these things and you could look down at people they make you just arrogant and prideful but it says love love becomes that place where we're actually thinking about other people and the idea of edifying, it literally means to build up. That what's motivating our hearts is that we're thinking, how do I, I want my life to be an encouragement to others. Now, pause. Because here's the danger. You might be listening to me, and part of the danger is that this is what you're supposed to hear in church. But you still might not actually be processing it through because I just want to tell you how foreign this is to sin and how foreign this is to our culture. We live in a world, and it's not new, it was that way in Corinth, where people make decisions really by one thing. It's about me. What makes me happy? What, do, what makes me feel good? What, what do I think is going to do good for me? And that so often the way that we make decisions, it's, I'm fine with it. I think it's great. I think you know, it's fine for me. And, and in the process of our thinking, maybe it's much more rare than we'd like to readily admit that we actually think about other people. 
They were actually loving them. They were actually thinking, you know, I just, I, it's not about me. It's not about what I want. I, you know, I, I want to be a blessing to other people. I, I want my life to be one that doesn't in any way turn somebody away from God, but does everything I can to turn people to God. Just by the way they see everything I hope I do. I mean, I want the whole thing to be that. And he gives it to us in kind of a neat way, but I just, maybe you caught it, but I love the way he does it. So go back again in verse one. I'll just begin reading there. But concerning things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. And if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. That's a great way to say it. You know, if you kind of, well, I, you know, I, I, I know. It's like, well, you, if you think you really know, you, you don't really know. I mean, if you're that arrogant, you don't really know anything because true knowledge brings you to humility. But if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. Now, for you guys who are kind of can, can track a, a, a you know, line of thought and, and kind of think it through, how did we just get there? I mean, what did we, I mean, here we're talking about, you know, pride in one sense, being puffed up and loving other people. And if you think you know anything, you don't know anything. And then he just says, if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. It's a great phrase. And in one sense, it's unexpected. We might have thought that he might have said, if anyone loves God, you know, then this one knows God. Or we might have thought it might have said, you know, if anyone loves God, he'll love other people. Or, but to say, if anyone loves God, why put that here? And then say, instead of uh, he knows God, but God knows him, well, it's a package deal. I mean, in one sense, maybe you get it. The whole thing goes together. I, First John does a great job of, of just helping us get it, that if we love God, and if we, if we love him, then we're known by him, we walk in that. First John will say it this way, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He says, you know what? We ought to love. We ought, we ought to love each other. I mean, we're driven by that as believers. We're created for that, because that's who God is. God is love. I mean, that, that is his nature. And if we love, we're born of him because we know him. I mean, it goes hand in hand, can't be any way other than that. But he who does not love does not know God. But God is love. It's impossible. It's impossible for someone to say, I love God. I just hate people. It's just, you know, just, that's just the whole thing. I just, me and God were great. I just don't good with anybody else. Can't, it can't, can't, that's not real love of God. You can't, you can't have one without the other. You can't, you can't really be drawn after God unless at the same moment it begins to soften your heart so you begin to love other people as well. You know, he says, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. <laughs> I mean, just, you know, there's just no kind of mincing the words there. Is that, you know, like, it's like, yeah, I love God, I just don't like people. Well, then you're lying. Because he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he's not seen? It can't happen. It, it, it goes as a package deal. We, the whole thing flows there. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the, the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments aren't burdensome. This is the whole thing goes together. Okay, so I love God, I love people, which causes me to want to walk in obedience. I mean, the whole thing is there, and if I love God, walk in his ways, love his people, God knows me. I mean, that's it. God, God, it's as if God looks upon us and says, I know you. I recognize you. I mean, that you, in one sense, recognizing we have a relationship with him, and that sense defined by all of it. That's what he's telling us. He says, if we do that, if we're walking in this kind of a place, if we love God, which means we're loving people, which means we're trying to do the right thing, again, he just tells us, if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. God knows him. I mean, that's just a, that's a great place. And I just want to tell you this. There's nothing higher than that. In our selfishness, we might find ourselves thinking, but I don't want to make that sacrifice. I don't want to, what if I like eating that meat? And now you're telling me I can't go eat this meat sacrifice to an idol because of this person that I'm with right here. And, you know, that's a big sacrifice. But I want to tell you, there's nothing more than knowing God's pleasure. When you do the right thing and you do it for the right reason, to know that God loves you and just since I'm just, I'm walking in that. He says, that's, that's everything. I mean, that's the whole deal because we, we, we have this. We have this, this love that God has worked into us, and he's calling us to have that. Now, catch this, and again, I hope this helps make it more definitive. Let's go down to the end of the passage. Again, just for context, in verse 12, but when you thus sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, 
If food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. Paul makes some incredible just declarations for himself. He says, therefore, here's what I'm going to do. He says, in one sense, I'm going to be, because of this is where I am, this is what I'm going to do, and I want you to catch this passion. But I also don't want you to mistake what he's saying. He's not making it a law. He's not coming down with rules that now you have to do it. In fact, so much so, it's not even a big deal if you end up eating the meat. Hey, fast forward just for a quick moment over to chapter 10. He's dealing with the same thing, and so he tells us in verse 25, Eat whatever is sold in the meat market, asking no questions for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord and the fullness and all its fullness. So he says, just, just buy the meat. Don't even, don't even worry about it. I mean, it's not like you're worried about the whole thing. If any of those who do not believe invite you to dinner and you desire to go, eat whatever set before you, asking no question for conscience sake. In other words, catch it right here. This isn't like the spiritual pride, because spiritual pride can do this, where you're sitting down with somebody in the, at the, a meal, and maybe you'd be sitting down at Corinth, and they set meat before you, and you kind of, well, you know, I was just wondering if this meat has been sacrificed over to, or to this idol, you know, because I'm too spiritual for that. I don't, I don't eat meat sacrificed to idols because I'm really better. Than, he says, no, you, see, you don't, even know, don't even worry about it. I mean, just eat it. It's not like this is some rule that now you don't eat meat sacrificed to idols. It's, no, the, the, the rule is I love people, and that defines what I do. But here's the thing. It becomes a personal thing where Paul's going to say, here's for me, this is what, what I, I mean, there's nothing that I wouldn't do for my love for other people. That's going to define my life. See, I, I think about it again. I go back to the gray areas, and I want to tell you this. For many of us, and maybe it's not you, but for many of us, what we actually prefer is a list. And some of you have a list. Some of you look at these things as like, this is right and this is wrong. That's how it is for me. I mean, it's, a, it's black and white, the whole deal. And some want pastors to do this. I just want to tell you that in the history of the church, it's happened many times. Where intending perhaps good, what's happened is maybe a pastor or a leader has come down with a list. Okay, this is what you can do and this is what you can't do. You know, this is how long girls' skirts have to be, literally, there have been those rules made. You know, whether you can wear makeup, couldn't wear makeup, whether, whether you listen to music or didn't. I mean, people like that. And sometimes they say, just, just give me the list. And I want to tell you, that that's the problem. That's not what God wants for your life for a number of reasons. For starters, it would be legalism. Legalism is never what God wants. It goes back to the law. It puts us under bondage. And it's not freeing. But I want to give you the greater reason. Because God wants you to love people. He wants you to make a decision, not because somebody gives you a list, but because you're guided by love. Now that becomes a far more practical thing because there's not a list now that can be made of, of some of these gray areas. It becomes now to a moment-by-moment moment thing. And what it means is that what God wants your decisions to be made by, that you're living your day and you have a decision before you and you have an opportunity to do something and what you're thinking about is, God, I want to love you. Does this please you? God, I really care about people. I really care about them. And, and, and let that become the factor that helps you make the decision that's before you. I just want to tell you something. There is such incredible growth in that question. But it's hard as well. And there's a piece of us that, quite honestly, like it to be easier. I mean, I'm just telling you. Though maybe some of you are like, I don't like legalism. Don't put no law on me. No, I understand that. But some of you are like, no, just tell me what to do. I mean, just because it's, it's, it's so much more effort <laughs> to have to actually think about people. You know, and actually like... So, Lord, what, what would be good for them? I mean, how do I be a blessing to my husband, to my wife, to my kids, to my friends? I mean, I, we, I have a decision to make right now, and I don't want to think about me. I want to think about you, God. I want to love you first, and then I want to love them. That's a lot harder. That's what God wants. That's what he's asking. I mean, he's saying, here's what I want you to do. I want you to love them. And let that guide the choices that you make and, and, and the practice of the whole thing. And, and when we do that, we're beginning to live it out. And I tell you, it's a lot harder, but it's a lot more wonderful because that's who God is. I mean, that's what he has for you. I mean, I love it. Romans would deal with it as well. I'm sorry, Galatians. And he'd say, you know, for all the laws fulfilled in one word, even this, 
You shall love your neighbor as yourself. It's fulfilled in one word, which is love. This is the whole thing. It's really driven by one thing. Love. And honestly, would be, I'd love people. I'd love God. Jesus, again, telling it to us, saying, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, that it's meant to be this, that God wants me to love Him with the way I think, with what I do, with what I say, with my heart. He's not looking for you to just fill a punch list. I went to church Wednesday night, read my Bible, prayed. You can do all that and actually forget the most important thing, that all of that was meant to be, saying, God, I love you. I just love you. I, I want to I wanna be in your presence. I want to sing your songs. I want to I pray. God, it's not, it's not just this, I want to love you. And then to say, God, I want to love people. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two commandments, saying all the law and the prophets. Says that, I mean, that when that becomes everything, when that becomes who we are, it answers these questions. It answers them not in a legalistic way, but in a wonderful way. Where Jesus said, again, they'll, they'll know you. They'll, they'll know you're my disciples by the love you have one for another. That's what he's calling us to have. And I wonder. And again, this is just between you and the Lord. Maybe, you're, maybe it's very much a part of your life. Maybe this is already at work in you. But I wonder if you could be honest. And maybe understand, maybe part of it. I mean, I wonder, when's the last time today that you came into a situation and you were thinking about somebody else. You were thinking about, I, wanna, I wonder if there's somebody I could love on. I wonder if there's something I could do that would bless them. See, you might have come to church here this evening. And there's, 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 a, there's a danger that you could come here and quite honestly, you could have come entirely selfish. I mean, the whole time you've not thought about anybody but you. I, I like that song. I don't like that song. You know, I, I, I like that person. Not that crazy about that person. I mean, just, just being honest, I mean, I just, I, I, I like this conversation. I don't like that conversation. Oh, 1 Corinthians 8, I like it or I don't. I mean, the whole time it's all about you. Or it could have been that you came in this evening and you thought, oh, I'm so glad. I'm going to pray for that person tonight. And, and I, I, I hope, Lord, is there anybody you'd have me to encourage? Is there something tonight that would help, that you want me to walk in, that would just help me to love you and love other people? And you came just looking for somebody to love on. Maybe I just want to, can I pray for somebody? Can I encourage somebody? And I'm, I'm, I'm going to make a decision, you know, whether it be in, you know, where we eat in the, in the meal or afterwards and what I'm thinking about. I mean, it's actually, actually happening. Not as some kind of rule but you actually loved people tonight. I mean, I'm just wondering if that happened. I mean, I'm wondering if it was there because the great danger is that we could talk about it and never do it. And he's calling us to that. He's saying, you know, knowledge puffs up. <laughs> knowledge can make you arrogant. Love. Love edifies. Love becomes where we're concerned about people and we, and we love them and we live a life that's entirely different. It's not a legalistic nor condemning life, but it, it actually motivates us. But once more, the only way to live that is to actually do it. It's not like we just make a decision where we come and say, okay, what's the loving thing to do? Is the loving thing to eat meat or not? I mean, tell me now so I can just, just decide and never have to make this decision again. No, that's not actually what you get to do. Every, just every moment, whether it's buying the meat in the market or somebody invites you to do at that moment, what you need to be thinking about is, God, I love these people. What, what am I doing right now that's either going to turn them away from you or what can I do right now that would build them up because that's what I'd like to do. I'd like to leave people that I come in contact with better. I want, because I, I, love edifies. Love doesn't just keep them from stumbling. Love thinks I want to leave people better off than I found them. I want to leave them encouraged. I want to leave them prayed for. I want to leave them built up because I love loving, I love God's love pouring through me. That's what he's calling us to. And I want to tell you, it's everything. It's, it's, it's everything we are. Loving God, loving people, this isn't optional. This is what Christianity is. This is what God's calling you to. Well, that's a good place for us to wind it down so you guys can close your Bibles. And, and we want to just go before the Lord and ask for that. That God would, 
bring us into a place where maybe it needs to begin with him. I found myself thinking, even just heading into this evening and, and through this afternoon about a passage in Revelation 2 where God rebukes the church in Ephesus and he just tells them they'd left, the, they'd left their first love. They'd gone, going through all the motions. They were a busy church. They were doing all the right things, but they'd left that. And I want to tell you, it's meant to be that we love God first. It's not just because we go through the motions. It's not just because you're here, but to actually love him. And then to actually love people. To actually say, God, help me to love people. Help me to love, to not think just about me, but to go into situations and think, how could I be a blessing to that person? May God cause our hearts to change where that's actually the way that we think. Would you join me and ask for it? God, I know that as I bring this before you, it's not foreign in the sense that it's not something that's not meant to apply to every one of us. It's not just a select few of us that you've designed or called to be those that walk in the first and second great commandments. It's meant to define every single one of us. Where we're going through the motions and missing that, we're missing life. God, you've called us to love you with everything that we are. That our lives would be lived day by day as expressions of just saying, God, I want my life to be one that loves you and what I do and what I say. I want to please you. I want to be known by you. God, I pray for that. But Lord, understanding it's not an option that we'd also love people. It's impossible to say that we love you and yet hate people. It just doesn't work. It's not a part, it's not the way this relationship with you works. For if we really love you, then you'll also work within us a love for people. God, we need that. We're wrestling with so many questions at times, gray areas that they're just not clear. It's not, it's not clear what's right or wrong. And what you're longing for us to be is a people that make those decisions, not selfishly, not self-centeredly, but loving people, loving you. God, you see where that's present and you see where that's absent in our life. Would you hold your word before us and then change us to be more like you and more like what you describe in your words so that these are not just words on the page, but your word directing the very steps of our lives. We ask for it right now as we just seek you and ask that you would give us this love. We ask for it in Jesus' name. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. King of all days, King of all days, oh so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all for love's sake became poor. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, 
altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. And I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross so here i am to worship here i am to bow down here i am to say that you're my god you're all together lovely all together worthy all together wonderful to me here i am to worship here i am to bow down here i am to say that you're my god you're all together lovely all together worthy all together wonderful to me you're wonderful to me Beholding your beauty is all that I long for To worship you, Jesus, is my sole desire For this very heart you have shaped for your pleasure Purpose to lift your name higher And here in surrender in pure adoration I enter your courts with an offering of praise I am your servant come to bring you glory As is fit for the works of your hand Now unto the Lamb who sits on the throne Be glory and honor and praise all of creation resounds with the song Worship and praise Him, the Lord of Lord Spirit now living and dwelling within me Keep my eyes fixed ever on Jesus' face Let not the things of this world ever sway me I'll run till I finish the race Now unto the Lamb who sits on the throne In glory and honor and praise all of creation resounds with the song Worship and praise Him, the Lord of Lord Holy Lord, You are holy Christ is the Lord. Holy Lord. Holy Lord, you are. 
are holy Jesus Christ is the Lord Now unto the Lamb who sits on the throne be glory and honor and praise all of creation resounds with the song worship and praise him the lord of lords the lord of lords the lord of lords the lord of lords oh lord jesus Truly, you are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. Lord, we were made to bring you honor and glory and just to bring praise to your name. And tonight, Lord, we do that. Just in coming in pure adoration. Lord, I thank you for the word that we've heard tonight. And I just pray, Lord, you change us. Lord, I just ask God that you would make us a people who love you first and foremost. And then, Lord, that we extend that love to those around us and Lord, work that in each of us. Cause it to grow. Lord, cause us to lay down our rights and just be those that are willing to put aside to sacrifice, Lord, if need be. Lord, to edify, to build someone else up. Work that in us today. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, bless you guys.